Lovely layoff. And on it goes. And onside here. It's Arjen Robin for Chelsea with a great chance. Oh. What a tackle. They talk about great goals. That is a great challenge. Fantastic work from Ledley King. Was he or wasn't he offside? But he gets the benefit, Robin. Look, Ledley King's got six, seven yards to make up. And he's like a train powering back and stabs it away from Robin just as he's about to pull the trigger. Brilliant work. Hey guys, welcome to another classical edition of the Pythagoras Perspective. In today's edition, we're going to be discussing Mr. Rolls-Royce, Ledley King. Now in this video, we're going to focus on Ledley King's prime, which I define as the period between 2001 to 2007. Now, before we go into that, a brief background on Ledley. As a youngster, played for Senrab FC, a club which is a Sunday league outfit, but it's produced the likes of John Terry, Saul Campbell, Jermaine Defoe and uh, Akin Fenwa. Now, not many know this about King, but he actually injured his knee on his Tottenham debut. He received a tackle from Rory Dillap 30 seconds into the game and... He was out for six weeks, had to have a knee operation, and he's been operating on it ever since. Anyway, it's uh, time to move on to the tactical analysis now. King came through for Spurs during the 99 season, and he was deployed as a centre midfielder by George Graham, the manager at the time. Now, it probably explains why Spurs were struggling so much at, in that phase, because the midfield was a complete mess. King was never really central midfield material. He was used as a box-to-box -box midfielder, and yes, he's a talented boy, but that was pushing it in terms of his ability levels. He was having to attack more than he would want. He was naturally gravitating towards the holding midfield position, but in those days, it was two-man midfields. Everyone was expected to be kind of box-to-box. -box. There wasn't specialist holding midfielders in the English game at that stage. So... King was very much ill-used by George Graham during that period. Now, eventually, Spurs got rid of George Graham and Glenn Hoddle came in as the next permanent manager and he played his customary 3-5-2. Now, in that formation, King played as a left-sided centre-back. He's very comfortable receiving the ball and playing it out and also using his recovery pace and his athleticism, he could cover Christian Zieger who tended to bomb on that role really worked for him in that system. What was interesting was that whenever Spurs would play Arsenal, he would switch over to the right-sided centre-back role where he'd be expected to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Thierry Henry. Now that speaks volumes about King because it shows that Glenn Hoddle, even at that young age, saw King as his best defender and hence why he wanted him to go up against Arsenal's best attacker. Now. Eventually, Spurs transitioned into a 4-4-2 and King played in the position that most of us know him for today as a traditional centre-back in a back four, but he played as a left-sided centre-back and Michael Dawson was the right-sided centre-back. At this stage of his career, King's pace wasn't used as consistently, he used that top, top level of pace when he absolutely had to, but he developed a more acute sense of positioning. He thought about the game a bit more and he wouldn't roam as high up the pitch as he did during his younger days. Now, for England, King famously filled in for Rio Ferdinand and John Terry at Euro 2004 during the opening game against France. I thought he was relatively solid in that game. His heading was excellent. He showed very good nimbleness in terms of being able to deal with the, the tricky movement of Henri and Trezeguet. His anticipatory skills were quite good in that game as well. He only lost his marker a couple of times, but generally on the whole looked very comfortable on the international scene. The only criticism I'd have is that his passing from the back was very conservative, but that's what you expect from someone with limited international experience at the time. In truth though, Sven saw King as a utility player, someone who he didn't quite trust over Terry and Ferdinand and instead tried to find a way to break him into the team and saw the holding midfield position as somewhere potentially where King could play. But King just didn't have certain qualities which he'd associate for that position. He was given the test against Argentina in 2005, leading up to the 2006 World Cup. 
and he was asked to man mark Raquel May. Now, as a midfielder, you have a lot more space to cover than when you're in a centre back position because at centre back, you've got your left back around you or your, your other centre back and the other full back. So the space that you're expected to cover is quite narrow. Whereas in midfield, especially if you're the single holding midfielder, you've got the whole pitch to cover. So it takes a lot more spatial awareness and King didn't quite have it for that position. Hence why he didn't really know when should I follow Raquel May, when should I leave him? Do I need to press aggressively? Do I need to sit back? His overall intelligence and feel for that position just wasn't quite there despite the fact that he'd played there under George Graham. The other criticism I have of King in that position was that he was very lazy in terms of picking up the ball off his centre-backs. His movement was very static. He didn't ask for the ball and be the pivot and playmake from the back. He just kind of let the game pass him by and was very passive. So overall, King for England had an underwhelming career and wasn't really given a chance in the best position that he played, which was centre-back. Anyway, moving on, we'll now do an analysis of King's attributes, including technical. In terms of athleticism, I think Ledley King was one of the most prodigious and all-round athletes English football has ever seen. I think so Campbell and Rio were specimens. They had pace as well as strength. But I think Ledley King had nimbleness and agility to go with it, which they didn't quite have to his level. And that marks him out as someone seriously special. Now what King's athleticism allowed him to do was to become freakish in terms of blocking the ball. He'd use his head, he'd use his left foot, his right foot. He'd put his body on the line when it came to making a block. And in this regard, I wouldn't put him as high as Saul Campbell or John Terry, but he was just below them. And I'd definitely put him ahead of someone like Rio Ferdinand in this respect. His blocking was superior. Whilst King's ability to read the game is better than your average defender, I think it's overrating him comparing him to a legend like Bobby Moore. Bobby Moore relied on his footballing intelligence to become one of the world's greatest all-time defenders. He had no pace, whereas King relies on his athleticism to get him out of trouble. I'd say he's inferior to Rio in this regard because Rio has proven himself at being able to read attackers' movements and cut off passes at the highest level. King hasn't. In terms of King's tackling ability it was very smooth very flawless in terms of its aesthetic appeal hence why he's been compared to Bobby Moore but the issue is that he lacked that extra bit of aggression which all great defenders even the more technically gifted ones have to be able to do you need to sometimes put your body on the line and go through a challenge in order to keep the clean sheet and for me King was just that tad too nice and that's why Henri praised him as one of the cleanest defenders he's played against in terms of King's aerial ability, for a tall guy, he had a great leap and he's someone who could deal with a variety of aerial situations because he could do a diving header, he could deal with set pieces, he could deal with a traditional number nine and a long ball coming in from a goal kick. He was very, very confident in all these situations. My issue with him is that one, he needed an aerially aggressive centre-back partner in Dawson, just like Ferdinand needed Vidic. But I'd say King could handle himself a bit more. But the other bigger problem is that there's footage of him struggling with diagonal long balls, especially against top, top centre forwards in Ruud van Nistelrooy and Thierry Henry, where he loses flight of the ball. And that's something you wouldn't expect to see from a John Terry or a Saul Campbell. At centre-back, King's man-marking ability was outstanding as he proved in duels against Thierry Henry and Luis Suarez in their prime. He was very much a, an attacker's worst nightmare. He had strength, pace, heading ability, nimbleness. So very difficult to change direction against him and get past him because he always seemed to get to the ball first. But his reading of the game was slightly exposed when pushed into midfield because suddenly he had to be more proactive rather than just reactive. And he struggled with that. And especially you saw against Raquel May, who as great as he was, wasn't an elite, elite number 10. This wasn't Zico or Maradona. And King struggled massively with keeping tabs on Raquel May, who completely ran the show. With regards to King's ball playing ability, Peter Crouch said that the most two-footed player he's ever played with was Ledley King. Now, I would probably agree with that. I think the only defender I can think of on the same level is John Terry, who's also very two-footed. But the issue I have with King is that he left me underwhelmed with all that technical ability that he has. He wasn't very influential with the ball at his feet. Most of his passes were very conservative. He reminded me of Rio Ferdinand, who both of them have a lot of ability, but they don't really show enough initiative in possession. 
whereas John Terry is more direct and shows more personality. King's quite a difficult character to assess from a mental perspective because on one hand he's incredibly brave, he's incredibly disciplined in the way that he prepared his broken body to compete at the highest level, week in, week out, with minimal training. He also looked very comfortable on the international stage, despite being given limited game time. But on the flip side, he's someone who lacked that larger than life personality you look for in a back line which is going to win big titles such as the Champions League or the Premier League. You look, compare him to someone like Ramos or Ferdinand, Nesta, etc. I don't see that primary centre-back mentality there. He's someone who would have been a secondary centre-back at a top team. And also for Spurs, he played in some decent teams, but he never quite managed that rear guard to levels which pushed Spurs to title challenges or sustained runs in cup competitions. Nevertheless, I'd say overall he did have an elite mentality. I just wouldn't rate it higher than someone like John Terry. So in conclusion, how good was a prime Ledley King and how good could he have become without injuries? Now at CDM, Ledley was simply not elite. He was reactive in this position, not proactive. He didn't get into good positions to receive the ball and his impact in possession was negligible. At centre-back, he was in his prime, one of the top five centre-backs in the Premier League. But I wouldn't put him above Terry, Carvalho, Rio or Vidic based on the prime level that he showed because his mentality didn't quite match the others. Talent-wise, he was the equal of any of these players. And he was certainly more talented than Nemanja Vidic, and athletically more gifted than Terry, but consistency-wise, not on their level. How good could he have become without injuries? Athletically, he would have been England's most gifted defender of all time. Technically, for me, he was not as good as a Bobby Moore, nor was his defending or leadership as elite as a Bobby Moore. However, I think overall he would have still been in that conversation with Rio, Terry, definitely above Carragher and probably would have displaced one of them around Euro 2008. He's the type of defender who, in my opinion, would have thrived in international football where the tempo's a bit slower and calm heads tend to prevail. But I reckon he wouldn't have been remembered as the best Premier League defender purely because it takes consistency. You have to be aggressive from week to week. And for me, he's simply too passive in terms of his personality to be that dominant at centre-back for multiple campaigns continuously. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Check out the website and see you guys again next time. Bye.